Providing for your family with your writing may seem like an impossible dream right now, but it is totally achievable. I've helped many authors make it happen, and if you're willing to put in 40 hours a week, you can make enough to support your family. You may not get rich, but you can make a living doing what you love. In fact, there are four different ways to do it, and you are going to learn about all four of them in this episode of Novel Marketing, the longest running book marketing podcast in the world. I'm Thomas Umstadt Jr., CEO of Author Media, and this is the show for writers who want to build their platform, sell more books, and make a difference with writing worth talking about. And this episode is for everyone, indie and traditional, both published and unpublished. Now, before we get into those four ways to make money as a writer, I'd like to talk about some numbers so you can understand kind of the market as it is. So the typical royalty for a traditionally published book is about 85 cents. But most authors aren't paid by the book. Most authors are paid uh, through an advance from their publisher if they're traditionally published. And don't worry, Indies, I'm getting to you next, so, so don't tune out. The typical advance, if you are traditionally published, is $5,000. But that's a little bit misleading. If you have an agent, a literary agent, that advance on average rises to $6,000. And if you don't have an agent, it drops to $3,500. And I will say, only three out of 10 books earn out their advance. So for most traditionally published authors, the money they get as an advance on their royalties is the only money they ever see. I mean, you can't make a living off of a $5,000 advance, but don't worry. There are ways to make a living. Now, that said, a major publisher may spend as much as $50,000 bringing the book into existence. $8,000 on editorial expenses, maybe $1,500 for printing and warehousing. Let's say $7,000 on marketing and PR, $15,000 on administrative costs, $5,000 paid to the author for a total cost of $50,000. So it's a big investment for a major publisher to publish your book, even though you are only getting a tiny fraction of that. All right, now let's talk about some indie publishing numbers. Uh, indies are able to get their books out into the world for much less money. It's not uncommon for an indie to spend $5,000 or less making their book. This is, you know, maybe two or $3,000 on editing, maybe five hundred to a thousand dollars on the cover and the interior design or the software for the interior design and let's say a book launch budget of fifteen hundred dollars there's typically no administrative cost and there's no advance paid to the author but the big difference is that this five thousand dollars that the indie is paying is coming out of the indie's pocket whereas the traditionally published author is getting that five thousand dollars put into their pocket so when they start off they start off at a disadvantage because they've spent money. So they have to make money just to get back to zero. But the indies make a lot more money per book. So while the traditionally published author may make 85 cents a book or 85 cents counted against their advance, an indie author can expect as much as $5 per book, sometimes more, depending on various factors. Now that said, the average print-on-demand book sells between 50 and 200 copies. The money isn't in the paper, especially for fiction. The money is in the ebook sales. And this is where being an indie really gets good because indies make a 70% royalty on ebook sales, assuming that they're not priced in a crazy way. So for a book priced at $4.99, you can expect a $3.49 royalty, which can add up pretty well. So $3.50 out of every $5. And I will say top indies are making $10,000 a month. Some are making even $100,000 a month. But this is not the how to make a fortune as an author episode. This is how to make a living as an author, a consistent living. So with all of that said, let's talk about the four ways you can make a living as an author. The first way is with your book. And the first step to making money with your book is to become better than the average writer. This is an industry that rewards superstars. So how do you become a superstar? You get better at writing books. You become the best at writing books. And there's a really good method for getting better quicker. And that is to practice your craft by writing short stories. 
It's a lot easier to get feedback on short stories. If you can master the fundamentals of character creation and master the fundamentals of creating tension, creating good scenes, a, a short story really crystallizes that. And if you can't write a short story, how are you going to be able to write your 300, 400 page epic fantasy? Some people are like, oh, I write epic fantasies. I shouldn't write short stories. No, you more than anyone else needs to write short stories because no one's going to give you feedback on your epic fantasy. And the biggest thing holding many authors back, the reason they're not making money is that they don't realize they have mustard on their face. They don't realize their craft isn't up to snuff. <laughs> so, and people will try to tell them, but they try to be polite about it and they, or they just don't have ears to hear. And anytime someone gives them criticism, they just say, Oh, you're not my target reader. You're not my target reader till eventually they don't have any target readers. That's <laughs> very tragic. So write short stories and then get feedback on those short stories. Perhaps pay for feedback, pay, you know, pay for education. Uh, be, making a living as an author isn't unlike making a living as a plumber, right? Before you make money as a plumber, you have to go to plumbing school, right? You, before you make money as a lawyer, you have to go to law school and you are going to have to invest a little bit in education. Uh, fortunately, you can get education very affordably. There are a lot of books on craft. And this is my next tip. If you're wanting to make money with your writing, you need to be reading books on craft. Uh, you, you need to practice short stories. And I should say for nonfiction folks, uh, you're not off the hook. <laughs> your short stories are blog posts. They're articles. You're still doing that short form writing and mastering the short form writing and reading books on craft. And you're getting feedback on your craft. Uh, we have for novelists a five-year plan. It's one of our longest running courses and many authors have used this to dramatically improve their craft and it's the five-year plan because it takes five years it's really it's an educational course some people say it's like getting a master's in literature but really focused on kind of writing for market you know, writing for readers not uh, writing for academic audiences and in this course we do what i just said we say write short stories and you're writing a short story uh, every month, and you're reading a bunch of books on craft. And you, you can discuss with the other students if you want, but it's really, it's just those two things. You don't have to get the five-year plan. You can buy your own books on craft, but the five-year plan does help. Uh, speaking of writing to market, that is also really important. If you want to write the kind of books that people want to read, you need to write the kind of books that people already want to read. This means you need to make an effort to get to know what they want so that you can serve them. If you want to make a living, and if that is your goal, you need to be thinking about your readers, involving them in the process as early as possible, and you need to be able to see past your own nose. Now, some authors are so focused on what they want to say, the story that's on their heart, they can't see past their own nose to see where they're going, and it keeps them from making a living. It is a real torpedo of careers. So you have to get past that if you want to make a living. If you just want to write what's on your heart, that's great. Write what's on your heart. But realize you're going to need a day job. <laughs> Don't quit your day job if you want to write what's on your heart. And who knows? Maybe you'll get lucky. But don't quit your day job until you get lucky. <laughs> so uh, another principle here is to think in terms of career. New authors only think about the next book. And they often really try to get that first book they ever wrote to be the masterpiece that puts them on the map. And that's just not how the world works. So you have to be faithful in the little things. And your first book isn't a masterpiece. Your first book exists to teach you how to write. It's, it was therapy. You know, writing it was really difficult. It was probably emotionally really difficult. It is for most authors. And you are learning how to write while you're doing it. And there's a lot of lessons and a lot of awkwardness that's in that first book. And Really, you don't want to be a child star. <laughs> Being a child star messes up the rest of your career. Let that first book, uh, if you're willing to take it, and here's a metaphor. When you're fishing, if you're willing to take that first fish you catch and cut it up into bait to catch more fish, you're going to catch more fish than if you take that first fish and just leave the dock, right? There's a time to walk away, but there's also a time to reinvest. And that first book is not the book to take to market. Speaking of the, uh, writing and career, thinking in terms of career and not being so invested on that first book, another principle that many career authors, many authors who are supporting their families with their writing are doing is they're writing books in a series. 
when you write your books in a series, each book promotes each of your other books. But this actually can be a mistake if that first book in your series is the first book you've ever written in your entire life because you're hanging your entire career on your very worst book, right? Because each book you write makes you a better writer. <laughs> and if that first book, your worst book, is the entryway, for many authors, it's not good enough to make people want to read the second book and so on. And even though that third or fourth book is a masterpiece or maybe really compelling, the fact that people have to read all of these kind of educational books, the ones you are still using your training wheels on, keeps them from getting there. And if, if that's you, just put the books aside and start a new series, right? You can uh, always republish a book later and you can always start fresh with a brand new book. There are many authors who got off on the wrong start and they were able to rescue their careers. Uh, this didn't used to be the case. It used to be uh, back when traditional publishing was the only option. If your first book was a failure, your whole career was doomed because no traditional publisher would touch you. And that's still more or less the case. In traditional publishing, if you have bad numbers, no one wants to work with you. Uh, even if you used to be successful, if your books, your recent ones, have bad numbers, no one wants to work with you. I got to see this as a literary agent, and it was tragic. Authors who had been successful lost touch with their market. Their recent books didn't sell well. Publishers that used to answer their calls now were not returning in their calls. That said, as an indie, nobody knows. The, the thing about writing a failed book is that no one read it, which means it hasn't hurt your reputation. <laughs> so unless it was a huge success and everyone read it and hated it, but that's not usually the case. And as an indie, you can reinvent yourself at any time and you can still sell books into a market. And each book is judged, for the most part, on its own merits by readers who don't know who you are. Another way that you can think career is to publish often. The more books you have, the more money you make. This is a really simple principle. And the math here is really sim simple. Let's say you need $75,000 a year to support your family. Now, in some parts of the country, that's a fortune. In other parts of the country, that is, you know, barely scraping by. So, obviously, you'll need to adjust for cost of living in your area. But for the sake of math, let's say you need to make $75,000 a year. If you write only one book a year, that book needs to make $75,000. That is, like about what a book will make on the New York Times bestseller list if it's only there for a week. You know, it's between thirty dollars and $50,000 worth of sales to get onto the New York Times bestseller list of royalties, anyway, to the author. And so you're going to have to hope to be writing really smash hit books. And if your last book was not a smash hit, don't you can't plan on your next book being a smash hit or planning on your first book being a smash hit. This is not about hitting home runs. This is about getting on base, getting the runners moving around the bases with good, solid base hits. Now, if you can hit home runs, that's a really easy way to make money. And, and I've worked with authors who they hit home runs, their books sell hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars, and that's all they have to do to support their family. And it's, it's, it's a great life. If you really invest in your craft, you really invest in your writing, uh, you can get there, but it's a lot of work. And most people uh, tell themselves that they're the exception. They tell themselves that they're special, they're called by God, and they don't have to put in the work. And most people typically don't get good enough to get those kinds of results. Now, let's say instead of writing one book a year, you're writing six books a year. Well, now each book only needs to make $1,200. <laughs> and each book will help promote the previous books. So maybe not even twelve hundred, right? Maybe you're only needing to make ten thousand dollars per book, and you'll get enough of sales on your previous books in the series uh, to get you to that seventy-five thousand dollars a year. That is very feasible. You can get there with only a couple thousand fans. That is a a very achievable goal if you're independently published. If you're traditionally published, you'll need um, probably five to ten times that many readers but you'll also have access to greater distribution to get those readers, which it's easier to do depends on the kind of book that you're writing and your strengths and weaknesses. And I encourage you to listen to our other episodes on whether or not to go indie, because <laughs> we're not really going to go into that here. I'm going to assume uh, that you've already decided whether you're an indie or not. 
So you may be thinking six books a year. That's impossible. And let me just tell you, no, it's not. <laughs> if you're willing to put in 40 hours a week, you can get there. No problem. And the prince, you, what you'll need to do, of course, is learn how to write faster. The authors who make a living are able to write quickly. Excellence is quality plus speed, right? I, we recently moved into a new home in Cedar Park, Texas, to be closer to our parents with uh, three toddlers or two toddlers and a baby. Uh, we need to be near the in-laws, <laughs> both sets of in-laws. So Cedar Park, Texas is a perfect place for that. And in our new home, we're getting some electrical work done. And I had some of it done by handyman, some of it done by electrician. And it was very fascinating to watch. The electrician was able to change a light switch in half the time that it took the handyman, and he did a better job. Now, the electrician charged more per hour, but he ended up costing less for the same work. Why? Because he knew how to do excellent work. He wasn't learning. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly where all the wires went, and he knew exactly how to do it. He went in, he got the job done, and he got out. That is excellence. Anyone can change a light switch given enough time, right? You watch the YouTube videos, you you know read the articles online, you figure out how to do it. But that's not excellence. You, you can do quality work if you take forever. But if you're willing to invest in the craft and if you're willing to be disciplined in your approach, that's where you can get from just quality or perfectionism, which is a fancy word for fear, to true excellence, which means doing it quickly. Where you sit down and you do the work. So how do you speed up your writing. Well, I'm hoping to do an episode on this soon and maybe even a whole webinar on how to write faster. So there's a lot of techniques here, but I'll give you a couple quick ones right now. The first is to write early in the day. As my dad says, he who hoots with the owls at night cannot soar with the eagles by day. If you give your rested mind your writing, it will improve both your speed and your quality. Right? Your, your mind is rested when you first wake up. You, you're in your dreaming. You're, you sorted out you know, your emotions and the events of the previous day. When you first wake up or you know, within an hour or so of waking up is when you're most creative. And as opposed to, let's say you're writing at the end of the day. Right, You have all the burdens of the day, all the stresses of the day, all of the unexpected things that happen. Yeah, maybe in a perfect day you could write at the end of the day, but... So often things happen and by the time you sit down to write, if you're trying to write at the end of the day, you just there's nothing left in the tank. So use your sharpest axe to write. And this is one of those things is I've talked with and worked with thousands of authors. One of the things that they don't often talk about that the really successful ones do is they make writing the first thing they do. It's the big rock. They put it in the jar and regardless of what else happens in the day, they get their writing done. Uh, they also write persistently. Uh, I could also say they write consistently, right? This is doing it every day, creating a habit of writing. If you want to make a living as an author, you need to treat it like a job. And that means coming to work and working whether you feel like it or not. <laughs> so uh, there's a great quote. Uh, Seinfeld was talking about writing. He does a lot of writing for his comedy. And he's sitting there and he's not wanting to work. And he's looking out the window and he sees these construction workers in New York City walking through the cold rain after their lunch break, going to work. And he's like, these guys don't want to do their job either, but they're doing it anyway. I owe it to my craft to be as dedicated to comedy as these construction workers are dedicated to construction. So stop making excuses, sit down and write. Another thing that can help you with making more money with the book itself is to learn how to sell, right? It's best selling author, not best writing author, right? So the marketing is an important part of making a living as an author. And you're already doing the right thing, right? This podcast, we have almost 300 episodes. Right? This is episode 296, so we're four episodes away from episode 300. We have hundreds of hours of training on how you can sell more books, how to market your books. And one technique is to, you know, binge our backlist, <laughs> binge the catalog. I see it in the stats every month. A lot of authors will go through and binge our older episodes, our episodes from years ago, still get downloads and it's totally free. It's a really inexpensive way of leveling up your marketing skills. And another thing to consider if you're wanting to make more money with your book is to experiment with price points. If your book is really addictive, Right? You wrote a book people can't put down, and as soon as they finish it, they want to go on to read the next book. 
maybe be really aggressive with uh, reducing the price on the first book in your series so that you can get more people addicted to your series and then the other books in your series are more expensive. Or maybe your books can afford a higher price point regardless and a higher price point allows for you to spend more money on advertising, right? This is something you need to experiment with because you won't know the best price for your book until you've tried different prices for your book. Which, uh, speaking of which, you know, it's important to reinvest your book. As an author, you need to think of it as a business of writing. And part of being a business means that you're reinvesting in the business, right? Farmers don't eat all of the grain. They save some of it to plant the next field. And you need to not just take all the money you make from your writing and spend it, right? Some of that needs to get reinvested in acquiring new readers. Another tactic that can work as you write more books, is to relaunch older books. Uh, Especially for indies, this is really important because often those first books came out before they were fully baked because you didn't have anyone to tell you this book's not ready. But now if you go back and read it with your kind of enlightened eyes, as you've written dozens of books, you're like, oh my goodness, this book could be a lot better. Well, relaunch it. We have an episode on how to relaunch older books. And this can be a great way of basically getting a whole new book to sell to your audience without doing all the work, right? (laughs) Because reworking a book and relaunching a book is way less work than building a book from scratch. And then if you're traditionally published, one thing you definitely want to do is sign up for Amazon Associates. Again, we have an episode on this. And like I said, for 70% of traditionally published authors, the only money they make from their book after it's published is from Amazon Associates. They get an affiliate commission for sending people to Amazon because they're not filling out their advance. And this doesn't mean that their advance stays small, I should say. So there are authors who got you know $100,000 advance and they get another contract even though they don't fill out the advance. It's a way for publishers to increase and be more aggressive at trying to acquire talented writers. They very rarely will negotiate on the royalty, but they will often be very generous with the advance. But if you, you, know, you got that big advance and you still want to make some more money, Amazon affiliates and other affiliate programs for your book is a really important way to do it. And of course, also hiring an agent. This should go without saying based off of the numbers. But you know, some authors are like, but an agent will take 15%. And that's true. An agent will take 15% of your royalties. But 15% of a grapefruit is still more fruit than a whole grape. Half of a grapefruit is still more grape a uh, fruit than a whole grape. Uh, don't be bad at math. Don't let percentages blind you from the big picture. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what the percentage is. It matters what the total numbers of dollars are. Getting 100% of $10 is not nearly as fun as getting 85% of a million or even 100 or even 15. <laughs> so we don't have to give extreme examples here. All right, so we've talked about making money with your book, but there are other ways that you can make a living as an author, and the second one is with your knowledge. Now, there are some classic ways to make money with your knowledge, the most famous of which is public speaking. This has worked for authors for millennia. In fact, uh, there was a time when Mark Twain was uh, hard on uh, cash, and if I remember correctly, he made some bad investments. He made some speculative investments. He was really good at writing novels. He was really bad at business. And he was in some debt. And so what did he do to get out of debt? He went on a speaking tour as a novelist. He spoke around the country. And I think he even went to Europe. And he made so much money from that speaking, he was able to pay off his creditors. And authors speaking has been a tactic that has worked for millennia. And it still works today. In fact, many of the earliest books were just recordings. Somebody wrote down what the speaker was saying, right? The poet is reciting his poetry and somebody wrote it down. So there's a couple of ways that you can make money with speaking. Uh, One is with speaking fees, right? Somebody pays you to present. It's pretty straightforward. But the second, and this is not to be underestimated, is back of the room sales. And just last week, I had a whole episode about selling your book in person and how much money you make selling books in the back of the room. We're talking $10, $15 per copy, right? If you sell 100 copies in the back of the room, that's $1,000, that's $1,500, which is not bad for a one-hour talk. 
Now, you would be like, but we're in a perpetual pandemic, right? The, the conventions will never come back. The public speaking will never come back. And first off, I, I don't think that's true. I think the events are coming back. It will take longer than we anticipate, but people will start listening to public speakers again. But there is another way, and that is with podcasting. You right now are listening to my voice. This is a speech. In fact, what I'm presenting right now in this episode is pulled from one of my speeches that I give at conferences. And this is another way that you can make money and, and reach a lot of people. I reach far more people with my podcast than I ever did with my public speaking. Public speaking was a lot of fun, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't, didn't reach a lot of people. And it was a lot of hassle flying around the world uh, to speak to audiences. Uh, now, another way to make money with your knowledge is with online courses. And I'll say this is the primary way I provide for my family. So online courses are a really great way of helping people, teaching people a valuable skill. This is more uh, helpful if you write nonfiction. But I will say for most nonfiction authors, a course on your topic will make more money than a book on your topic. They go great hand in hand. The book can reach lots of people. It's a low price point, a low barrier to entry. But you're going to make a lot more money with a more substantive training course than you will just with the book. And I should say, as I give these tactics, don't feel like you have to do all of them. In fact, don't do all of them. I don't know any author who's doing all of these things and is successful. What I'm doing here is I'm filling the pantry full of ingredients so you can cook the right dish for you. So if you write romance, don't feel like you need to put together a course on dating and relationships or how to have a better relationship with your your husband or, or something like that. Th that's not the path. <laughs> there are other ways. Um, I'm just giving you ideas of things that work. And then finally, one-on-one uh, -on -one consulting. I, I know authors who, in fact, I have one author client who makes six figures just with his consulting business off of his books. And he doesn't have very many clients. He works with high net worth individuals. They know him from his books. He has a handful of clients, and that is a, a really good source of revenue for him where they call him and they want to pick his brain. The more knowledge you have, the more people will want to pay to pick your brain. And you can do this in person. You can do this over Zoom. You know, paying advisors is the thing kings have done for many years. <laughs> so and you can be one of those advisors and having a book is a great key for unlocking the door into consulting. If you want to, if you don't want to do consulting or coaching, you don't have to, but it is a way that you can make a living. And some people do make a living with nothing but consulting. Okay, so we've talked about making a living with your book. We've talked about making a living with your knowledge. Now let's talk about making a living with your writing skills. So the carpenter doesn't just build the house. The house builds the carpenter. With each book you write, you get better at writing. And that skill set is a very valuable skill set. And the fastest, easiest way to put that skill into practice is to become a freelance copywriter. There is a desperate need for good marketing copy, for people who are good at English and good at writing to write words that go on the internet. So we've had an, the demand is effectively limitless. There's almost unmeasurable demand for good writing. And the supply of good writers is very low. I know this because I have tried to hire good writers and finding people who are finding people who think they're good at writing very easy <laughs> but finding people who've done the work they read the books on craft they got the mentoring they wrote the short stories or they wrote the blog posts and they know how to write it's actually surprisingly rare and i think part of it is because it's so different writing for normal people as opposed to writing for an academic context and the kind of writing that you learn in college is really divorced from what works in the real world, which is why you don't see the bestseller list dominated by CFA graduates. Right? Very rarely do you see a College of Fine Arts graduates actually doing well on the bestseller list, <laughs> especially considering how many of them are graduate each year. Each year, tens of thousands of people graduate from with fine arts degrees. And very few of them hit a bestseller list because the kind of writing they're taught to do isn't the kind of writing that connects with readers. And if you're reading books on craft, if you're practicing, you are learning how to do the kind of writing that connects with readers. Writing that doesn't dazzle people with how fancy it is, but instead it connects with them emotionally with how simple it is. Learning to write simply with small words and short sentences <laughs> instead of 
complexly with long words and long sentences. There's some websites that you could go to right now and get paid to do writing. And one's called Fiverr. One's called Upwork. So Fiverr.com with two R's, Upwork.com and WriterAccess.com. Now, all of these sites, you'll have a reputation on the site. There are projects to write things. You take a project, you get paid, and then your client will review you. And when you first get started, you'll have no reputation and say, oh, I am a great writer. I will only write for lots of money. That's not the way, unfortunately. What you have to do at first is you need to take the really cheapest jobs where they'll take a risk on someone with no reviews. And then you blow them away with how good the writing is. And you start to get those five-star reviews. The more five-star reviews you get, the more you can charge and you can keep raising your rates. And there are people on Upwork that will charge $50 an hour, $100 an hour for writing and they're totally worth it. And they get paid and they're booked for weeks or months because writing is really valuable and people will pay for good writing. And I will say a lot of your competition on these sites, they're not native English speakers. There's a lot of people who know English around the world and they get hired for these jobs. And so as a native English speaker, if you are one, you have an advantage. And if you're not a native English speaker, you can still make good money as a freelance copywriter. But again, read books on craft, <laughs> practice, practice, practice. Another way that you can make money with your writing is to have a blog and to sell ads on your blog. So there's, the, I won't go into the technical side of this, but there are a lot of ways to put ads in your blog or Google or some other ad partner will insert the ads automatically. And not only does this help bring in money, but it also protects you when you write a viral blog post, the Hosting bill can go through the roof. When I wrote my viral blog post, the big one, I got a $500 bill, $500 overage fee from my host because I got a million views in a month and that was not what I was paying for on my blog. So just keep that in mind. You don't have to put ads on your blog, but if you're writing posts that could be going viral, this could be a really great source of revenue. Also, if you're writing posts that are enduring hits on Google where you wrote an answer to a question that thousands of people are searching for every month and you're getting a steady stream of, of traffic, this can actually be somewhat passive income where you get a check every month from your ad partners for all of the page views that you're selling. So there's a, there's a whole world here. And I know people that are making the vast majority of their money just doing this because they know how to write the kind of posts that are answering the kind of questions that people are asking on Google. Now, if you're writing fiction, a really good way that you can put your writing skills into practice is to become an editor. So this is perhaps the most consistent way to make money with your writing skills. And editors make between $20 and $70 an hour, sometimes more if you're really top editors can make hundreds of dollars an hour, especially after you have a couple of super hits under your belt, right? You get the credibility and a good reputation. You can really command a high editing fee. And there's different levels of editing. So a lot of people think, oh, I, I don't want to hunt down typos. I'm not even good with typos, right? That's one kind of editor, a copy editor. But as an author, the kind of editor you probably enjoy doing more and that you're better qualified for is what's called a developmental editor. This is somebody who's editing the story, right? Helping the characters be better, helping the plot be better. It's big picture editing. It's the kind of editing where you're inserting comments more than you're using track changes or for nonfiction, you're editing the ideas, you're editing the persuasiveness. You're like, I don't think this illustration is really supporting your argument as well as it could be. Consider this other illustration more. This is the kind of editing that really a fellow author is better at. And there are tens of thousands of authors who quietly make a really good living doing editing. <laughs> it's a great job. And yes, you get less glory as an editor. Right, You don't get your name in big font on the front of the book. Okay, <laughs> if your goal is to support your family, sacrificing a little bit of glory may be worth it. Being a Barnabas rather than being a Paul. And just because you're editing doesn't mean you're not also writing books. A lot of editors, they edit on one side and they write books on the other side. Because writing a book is a little bit like panning for gold. Getting a hit requires a lot of practice, right? You got to step up to the plate quite a few times to try to get that hit. Especially if you're trying to be traditionally published, you really only make money doing the hits. And a lot of editors are good enough to get traditional contracts. So they're not doing the write lots of books really quickly path that the indies do, 
where they have a bunch of books and each book's making a little bit of money and collectively they're making a living with all of the books they're writing. It's not uncommon for editors to be writing fewer books also because you know, they're editing on the side and uh, they're hoping that they're going to strike it rich, right? They're, they're panning for gold. And when we say panning for gold, for those of you who are not in the States, you may not know the story, but they uh, discovered gold in California in the 1800s and thousands of people streamed across the West, you know, risking life and limb traveling across very empty land where there were no towns or cities. Uh, there's a whole video game just about the journey <laughs> to get to the gold rush called Oregon Trail, uh, a whole video game series, actually. And so, so then they would get there and they would pan for gold. And some people would find lots of gold and make lots of money. And other people, most people found only a little bit of gold. But other people, while they they only pan for gold half the time, and the other half of the time they served the people painting for gold, right? They made food or they made clothes or, or they ran a hotel for people to stay at. In fact, a very famous person who did this was a guy named Levi Strauss who didn't pan for gold at all. All he did was make blue jeans for the gold panners and he ended up making a lot of money doing that. In fact, you may have heard his name even today. So editing is like being more like Levi Strauss where you're serving the people who are taking the big risks. And Levi was a little unusual in that he doubled down and he didn't care about painting for gold at all himself. Most people who did really well did a mix. They did some painting for gold themselves, but they also served the others painting for gold. Another way that you can make money with your writing is writing for magazines. And this is great for both fiction and nonfiction. Obviously, it's a little easier if you write nonfiction, but writing for a magazine gives you practice getting feedback from an editor. In fact, it's a really great way to do it because you get feedback from a professional editor who you don't have to pay. They pay you. and You may not make very much money. Maybe it's $20 an article or $50 an article. Sometimes you can make a lot more for an article, but when you're first getting started, I think $25 or $50 an article is not uncommon. But you get those edits back and you get practice working with an editor. You get more familiar with Microsoft Word. You learn how track changes works and you get pushback on the fact that you're not using styles correctly in your Word document and all those little things that helps you get better at writing faster. And you know what? There are thousands of writers who make a living doing nothing but writing magazine articles, right? They just take this one tactic and they're able to support their family just with this. They get really good at pitching magazines and writing articles for magazines. And there are a lot of magazines out there online, offline, get into an airplane, there's a magazine in front of you. You sit at the doctor's office, there's a magazine in front of you. <laughs> there are millions of websites that need someone to write articles for them. All right, so we've talked about making a living with your book. We've talked about making a living with your knowledge. We've talked about making a living with your writing skills. And now it's time to talk about making a living with your celebrity, or you could say your credibility. This is perhaps the hardest one to get into, but it's where the fortunes are made once you get here. Uh, but you also can make just a normal living doing this. So this could be selling special access, right? A backstage pass, premium insiders club, mastermind groups, but even an autographed copy arguably is selling special access, right? You have a limited edition signed and numbered hardback. You're selling them for $100 each or $200 each. This is people who are bought in on you and they're willing to pay a little bit extra. Also a podcast. You know, some podcasts are selling knowledge, right? People come to this podcast not because they know who I am typically, but because they want the knowledge that they get from listening to this podcast. But other podcasts are based off of the fame and credibility of the person doing the podcast. So podcasting can fit in two of these categories. Uh, another way is related products. This is more for nonfiction. But uh, Dave Ramsey, for instance, he's got his very successful books where he teaches the envelope system of budgeting. When you go to his website, what does he sell? He sells envelopes for doing the envelope system. You don't have to buy one from him, but he sells a lot of them to people who want the official Dave Ramsey leather bound envelope system. You can also sell merchandise. This is one of those kind of sweeteners. The more successful you are, the more you can do things like selling merchandise with your book or your logo on the shirt or a hat or what have you. But the real money is in endorsements. Now, I'm not saying you're going to get hired by some big brand, right? Rolex isn't going to put you 
on a billboard. But that's not the kind of endorsements I'm talking about. I'm talking about affiliate revenue. So we talked about affiliate revenue as a way of making more money on your book, right? You include an affiliate link for your book and Amazon will pay you for everyone who uses that link. But it doesn't just work on your book. It also works on other books. And I just did an episode on this. One of the great ways that you can build your writing skills, build your taste, get more familiar with the craft is by reviewing books similar to yours. And you can make money doing it, right? If you send people to Amazon or some other bookstore with an affiliate program, you get a commission on those sales. But there are lots of businesses that have affiliate programs. There are courses that have affiliate programs. So maybe you don't want to make the course. You just want to be an affiliate for the course. Well, some courses have affiliates of 30%, 40%, sometimes 50%. And 50% on a $500 course, you bring up enough students there, you could live just doing that. In fact, I know authors who make the vast majority of their money doing affiliate marketing for other people's products. They're like, ah, making things myself is too much work. I'm just going to curate the best of what other people make and send my audience there and make the easy money, not the hard money, right? The hard money is creating the course from their perspective. The easy money is sending people to that course. So let me give you some quick affiliate marketing tips because this really is lucrative, but there are some pitfalls in affiliate marketing. I want you to avoid those pitfalls. Uh, So the first and perhaps the most important is to be picky. Only recommend products that you would use yourself. Better yet that you already use, right? Only recommend books that you have actually read or that you're familiar enough with the book from other people you trust. But, But really, if you're a romance writer, and you're recommending romance books, you really need to have read the book (laughs) before you recommend it. So if somebody says, hey, will you be an affiliate for me? Ask them for a sample. Somebody says, hey, will you be an affiliate for my course? Make sure they give you access for their course. If they want you to be an affiliate for their mattress on your podcast, get the mattress. (laughs) Have them send you the mattress, really, and for free. Sleep on the mattress, and then you can recommend it having tried it. And this is not an example that I'm just making up. Like, I know podcasters who sleep on their sponsors' mattresses. <laughs> it's actually very common. The mattress industry really went big on podcast advertising. But no, I have, I'm happy with the mattress I have. So if you're a, a mattress company, don't contact me. <laughs> I'm good. Uh, be helpful, right? Pick affiliates that are interesting to your audience. Only recommend products that will make your audience's lives better. And be transparent, right? Disclose your affiliate relationship. If you are doing a good job thrilling your fans, uh, then they'll want to use your affiliate links. For me on authormedia.com, whenever I put an affiliate link, I put in parentheses right next to the link, affiliate link. That's more than I need to do. Legally, I could put the disclosure anywhere on the page at the bottom where few people would see it. But I've had enough listeners email me saying, hey, do you have an affiliate link for such and such that I now make it really clear because they want to use the affiliate links. It doesn't cost them any extra, but they know that it helps support the show. And I really appreciate that. This is a, it is a good source of revenue for me to support my family is you using my affiliate links. In fact, I got, I got enough emails from listeners for various things I recommended that I now have a page of just affiliate links called recommendations. It's all of the various products I've ever recommended on the show and the affiliate link for those products and for the products that I recommend that don't have an affiliate link. (laughs) So if you're like, what was that WordPress theme he recommended? I don't remember. Just go to author media and click on resources and then click on recommendations and it will give you the whole list. And if there's something missing or something I forgot to add to the list, shoot me an email, thomas at authormedia.com and I will add it because I find myself recommending lots of things on the show. Some of them are affiliates. Some of them are not. And Maybe some of them were missing from the page. I don't know. Uh, Be interesting. Don't just promote affiliate promotions. I sometimes will see this. An author will do a a course affiliate promotion, right? It's a $500 course or a $1,000 course with a 50% affiliate commission. And suddenly they've made $10,000 with a campaign. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is now all I'm going to do. (laughs) It's like your posts need to be interesting. You can't just do affiliate promotions. Yes, you had this one successful one, but you need to serve more than you promote your audience or you'll lose your audience and you can burn out your audience if all you ever do is affiliate promotions. 
And finally, be magnanimous, right? Recommend competing books. You know, as long as they're worth recommending, recommend them, right? Your super readers will read multiple books a month, sometimes multiple books a week. There was a year I listened to 100 audiobooks in one year. And so no author was able to supply me with 100 audiobooks I wanted to read that year. And I've purchased over 1,000 audiobooks since graduating college or since signing up for Audible, I should say. I have over 1,000 Audible books in my library. And no one author is able to supply all that. So don't feel like, oh, if I recommend this other romance writer, people aren't going to read my romance books. Or if they start reading this other epic fantasy book, they're not going to read my epic fantasy book. No, if you give them a good recommendation, they're going to trust you. I have a friend who doesn't recommend books to me very often, but every single book he's recommended to me, I have loved, even though they are very weird and very strange. In fact, one time for my birthday, all he gave me was a book that he had obviously read. Like this book was in bad shape. It was a paperback and it was rough. And I was like, this is back when I was still reading paper books before I'd gone audible only. And I was like, well, I've liked all the other books he's given me. So I'll, I'll read this one. And I loved it so much. I ended up buying the whole series in paper and reading them and and really enjoying them. And you could be that trusted friend for your readers. And again, if you want to learn about writing book reviews, go back and listen to my episode on that or read the blog post version. So those are the four ways that you can make a living as a writer. Now, remember, that's the pantry. Don't do all of them. Hopefully you got an idea of like, oh, here's something that I can implement on. It's better to dig one well 100 feet deep than 100 wells one foot deep. I heard that from Randy Inger Manson, but it, it's an old saying, right? <laughs> Focus, do a few of those really well. And w- once you get the well working, you can move on to the next thing. So the, you can have many sources of revenue. I interviewed Joanna Penn a couple of years ago, and she has, I think, over 100 different revenue sources as an author. She's got lots of different ways money is coming in, uh, which makes her very uncancelable, right? If somebody were to cut off one of those revenue sources, she'd be fine. Somebody could cut off 10 revenue sources and she'd still be fine. But she didn't start them all at the same time. Once you get one well working, then you can move on to the next well. Our sponsor today is the course I mentioned earlier, the five-year plan to becoming a best-selling author. This is a course that I put together with best-selling and uh, Christie Hall of Fame author James L. Rubart, also former host of the Novel Marketing Podcast. And we take you through a five-year kind of strategic plan to becoming a best-selling author. For a lot of authors, they don't know what to work on next and when to do the various things in their career. And the going back and forth and working on the wrong thing at the wrong time ends up causing them to take 10 years or more before they get to that point of profitability, before they get to that point of making a living. And so I know five years sounds like a lot, but if you talk with any number of authors, it's actually very fast. It's very expedited, but it is a lot of work, but it really pays for itself. We have a lot really happy students who are going through that course and seeing their careers transforming. And often with the short stories, they're like, oh my goodness, I'm getting so much better, so much faster than I thought I was. I had, or often how it's phrased, I had no idea how bad I was until I got so much better. And now I'm looking back. It's like, man, I thought that was my best, but my best has gotten so much better. So I encourage you to check out that course If you're a patron, uh, it's 50% off, so it's much cheaper to become a patron first and then get the course. (laughs) It pays for itself right away. Uh, And speaking of patrons, I'd like to uh, thank all of the new patrons who joined last month. So uh, we got some new patrons. This is, I think, something I want to start doing is just reading off the names of everyone who became a patron. So if you want to hear your name on the show, uh, this is the time you can become a patron. So thank you to Mackenzie Lane, Jessica Plumley. Adair Elise, Hunter Crowder, Pat Butler, Rebecca Martal, Catherine McDougall, and Mike Minoski. So thank you so much for becoming patrons of the Novel Marketing Podcast. Your support really does help keep this show on the air. I really appreciate it. And if you can't afford to become a patron, but you still want to support the show, you can. And at no cost to you, just use one of the affiliate links that we have at authormedia.com slash recommendations. Uh, it's the things maybe that you're already buying, but if you buy them with our affiliate link, the show gets a little bit, which helps support the team that puts it together. Speaking of the team, this episode's audio was edited by William Umstadt. The blog post version was created by Shauna Lettler, and I'm Thomas Umstadt Jr., your host. To find that blog version, visit 
authormedia.com slash 296. And thank you for listening and live long and prosper.